So, uh, I think we all know that uh, this year's festival has three themes, conflict and its resolution, city walls and trees. And tonight my focus is on trees and in particular the tree of life, but if you will forgive the pun, I also intend to branch out into the theme of conflict resolution. Trees stir very deep passions. In one of the favorite fantasy books of this passing age, this age of Middle Earth, trees play a very significant symbolic role. Among the most attractive characters in The Lord of the Rings is Treebeard, the Ent, and ancient tree shepherd. Tolkien was, of course, a scholar of Anglo-Saxon, and Ent is derived from the Anglo-Saxon word for giant. And there is an Anglo-Saxon poem, The Ruin, which contains a phrase used of crumbling Roman cities like Bath, Orthanc enter Gavok, the work of cunning giants. And under the shadow of Orthanc, the tower which stands in the ring of Isengard, and which I'm told you can now build out of Lego bricks, that's hot off the press, that, <laughs> the off-white wizard Saruman is collecting fuel for his infernal machines, which are mass-producing an army of fighting Urukai. The orc foreman obsequiously observes to the wizard the trees are strong, my lord. Their roots go deep. And Saruman replies, rip them all down. The world of living, growing things is sacrificed to dreams of domination in a scene which reflects what has actually happened to the forests which used to cover much of the earth and not least England's green and pleasant land. Before the Roman conquest, about two-thirds of lowland Britain was forested with Kipling's oak, ash, and thorn, but also with birch, Scots pine, hazel, beech, hornbeam, and possibly sweet chestnut, although that is uh, a matter of controversy. The Romans introduced other species, notably lime, plain, box, elm, and poplar. Tudor industry, construction, charcoal burning for fuel, and especially shipbuilding, led to a considerable deforestation and early concern about the disappearance of such a crucial resource. John Evelyn published his silver, uh, snappily subtitled A Discourse of Forest Trees and the Propagation of Timber in His Majesty's Dominions in 1664. And since Evelyn's time, there's been a spate of publications, but probably none to compare with a book I, I wonder whether you know, The Trees of Great Britain and Ireland, in seven volumes, published between 1906 and 1913. And the centenary of this exhaustive work has been recently celebrated by the Society of Irish Foresters in a sumptuous limited edition reprint. The promoter of the project, Henry Elwes of Colesbourne Park in Gloucestershire, wanted his book to be, and I'm quoting him, a life history of every tree that has been cultivated in this country from the seed to the stage at which it was converted or convertible into timber. His chosen collaborator in this massive task was Dr. Augustin Henry, an authority on the flora of China. No expense was spared, and the result is a most beautiful book, recording many individual specimens now alas lost. But my theme, however, is not so much scientific dendrology as the symbolic aspect of trees in the various cultures of the world. While working on the restoration of St. Ethelberger's Church here in the city of London, I tried to identify symbols that would express its purpose as a center of reconciliation and peace. 
the church was a victim of the IRA bomb in 1993. That little church in Bishopsgate had survived the great fire. It had survived the blitz, but was almost entirely destroyed by an explosive device detonated as a result of an ancient quarrel which had a religious dimension. It used to be fashionable to say that the religious element in the Irish conflict was really reducible to economic and social factors. But in the 21st century, we've come to understand once again the power of religion for good and for ill to bind people together and to contribute, unless we are very careful, to the demonization of those outside the tribe. After becoming Bishop of London in 1995 and greatly assisted by the late Cardinal Basil Hume, I launched an appeal to restore the church as a place where followers of all religions would feel able to come to cooperate in preventing and transforming those conflicts which had a religious dimension. In the 1990s, hard-headed people in the city of London couldn't understand why such a center might be necessary. Religion for them was harmless and a slightly eccentric leisure time interest. Another cup of tea, Vicar. 9-11 <laughs> changed all that. It had its very tragic side, uh, the story of the bombing and restoration of uh, St. Ethelberger's. One of the creatures that actually survived the bomb, which was devastating, and people were killed in the near vicinity of the church in a very tragic way, but one of the survivors were the goldfish in the pond at the back. And I was very, very concerned that uh, having survived the bomb, they shouldn't fall victim to anything else. So I repatriated them to a stately pond in Kensington where they were promptly eaten by herons. <laughs> but as we searched for common symbols in the major world religions and cultures, it was the tree that constantly made its appearance. And as the anthropologist Morris Block says, trees are good to think with. The root of the tree delves and the shoot reaches up. I've just reached this point with a black poplar planted in the garden to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee. And then the tree will stretch out under heaven in four directions. So the tree connects this middle earth with the heavens and with the underworld. It can be seen as a cosmic axis of the kind celebrated in the Maypole. Then, as in the vision of the prophet Daniel, the axis of the world can also be a world tree. This is one of his visions. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much. And in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had a shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwell in the boughs thereof. All flesh was fed of it. Perhaps the most vivid picture of the world tree is painted in Norse mythology, both in the poetic Edda, which is a collection composed from very ancient sources and uh, put together finally in the 13th century, and in the Prose Edda, which was uh, composed by the priest, Snorri Sturluson. Yggdrasil was an immense ash tree at the center of the world. And Ig was one of the names of the god Odin. Drasil means horse. And one of the poems of the Poetic Edda describes how Odin once sacrificed himself to himself by hanging on a tree which is identified with Yggdrasil. I know that I hung on a windy tree nine long nights, wounded with a spear, 
dedicated to Odin, myself to myself, of that tree where no man knows from where its roots run. And Odin then describes how he had no food or drink, and peering downwards, he took up the runes, screaming as I took them. Trees, as in this case, are frequently connected with the search for wisdom, and the possession of the runes was part of Odin's ceaseless search for wisdom. Odin declares that Yggdrasil suffers agony more than men know. A heart preys upon it from above and below the dragon, Nidhogg, malice striker, that means, gnaws at the roots. The references to this great world ash, to Yggdrasil, are scattered throughout Norse literature and attempts to construct a comprehensive and consistent picture of the world tree probably over-systematizes a poetic concept. And anyway, it's easy for us all to look it up and, and look at the details. But it's obviously significant that the world ash unites a three-decker universe familiar from so many mythologies. There are the sky gods, there's ourselves, Homo sapiens, closely connected, Homo, closely connected to the humus or the earth, because we are creatures of the dust, and that is where Genesis and Darwin agree. We are creatures of the dust, stardust, in fact, Adam, the name of the first human being in the book of Genesis, simply means creature of the dust. And then there is the underworld. The 18th century three-decker pulpit perhaps unconsciously traced the same pattern. Uh, that was a pulpit used uh, to deliver the sermon from the top, and then the gospel was read halfway up, and the community notices were given by the clerk on the bottom story. <laughs> In Greek mythology, the chief sky god, Zeus, is also associated with a tree, the oak. And in his ancient sanctuary of Dodona, high up in Epirus, a most dramatic place where you can still feel the presence of the old gods, uh, a sanctuary in northwestern Greece, Zeus communicated through the saturation of the wind in the leaves of the oak trees. And this is a very ancient sanctuary. Uh, it's even found in the Iliad, in Book 16, where we are told that the priests of Dodona went like Moses in the presence of the burning bush. They wore no sandals, they went barefoot, and they slept on the floor of the sanctuary in order to encourage, we are told, revelatory dreams, because Zeus also communicated through dreams. And very interestingly, there's a, there's a continuation of this way of being a seer, seeing deeply into things. There's a continuation of it in the most recently canonized saint in the Greek Orthodox Church is someone called St. Nectarius of Egina. He lived in about the 1920s. And one of the things he did was he taught his disciples to listen to the song, the individual song of trees, as a way of entering into a state of contemplation. I dare say many of you have had that experience of listening profoundly to the song of trees. Other deities, of course, had their favored tree. For Athena, it was the olive. And here I must confess to you, my brothers and sisters, that on a recent visit to the Acropolis in Athens, I was tempted and I fell. You will remember that there was a contest between Athene and Poseidon for the patronage of the city of Athens. Poseidon, the sea god, struck the earth with his trident and a well appeared, but the water was salty, so the prize went to Athene instead, who presented the city with an olive tree. 
Now, the Bishop of Birmingham and I were on an official visit to the Church of Greece, exploring, among other things, the possibility of establishing a hospice for seriously ill children. We were, as uh, decorum dictates in the Orthodox Church, we were wearing our cassocks on the Acropolis when we were surrounded by a very large crowd of Japanese tourists. <laughs> they began prodding us, <laughs> and I suppose imagining that we were some kind of reenactment, some kind of tourist attraction, they took photographs and demanded to know who we were. I said that I was the priest of Athena, and the Bishop of Birmingham represented Poseidon, and that we met once a year to rehearse the old quarrel. <laughs> to my horror, I saw that notes were being taken, <laughs> as well as the photos, and I imagine that mothers' unions, meetings, the length and breadth of Japan have since been entertained by the astonishing apparition on the Acropolis. <laughs> Other gods had their proper trees. Demeter was associated with the fig, Hera with the willow, and famously, Apollo with the palm under which he was born on the island of Delos, and with the laurel which played a part in the apparatus of his oracle at Delphi. Symbolic trees, with their associations with pagan worship in Europe, were in consequence sometimes the victims of the advance of Christianity. One of the most... Um, uh, perturbing pieces of information I've received recently is from um, a professor in the University of Cambridge who specializes in forest people uh, and he visits the forest dwellers in Borneo and he came back recently um, looking rather glum and saying to me the forest people are very happy uh, because they've been converted to evangelical Christianity the only problem is that this means that they needn't believe anymore that the trees have spirits and can join in the logging. So it's not, um, not unalloyed good news. In his influential life of Martin of Tours, Sulpicius Severus records a confrontation over the felling of a pine tree in about 390 at the end of a century in which the Christian faith had moved from being banned and subject to persecution to being the official religion of the Roman Empire. And of course, next year, we're going to be celebrating the 1,700th anniversary of the Edict of Milan, which actually made Christianity a legal religion within the Roman Empire. But by the time of St. Martin of, of Tours, it had moved from being the subject of persecution to being the official religion of the empire. From locating the sacred in natural features, the Christian faith shifted the locus of sanctity to holy people and to relics of the saints. And this is a major shift. It's, it's a fascinating shift as we move from the religion of the ancient world to uh, Christianity. One of the most um, vivid examples of the change that was wrought is in some of the temples which are still used as churches. The Temple of Syra, of Athena, for instance, again, in Syracuse in Sicily. Um, temples in the ancient world were meant to be gazed upon from the outside. They were statements about perfection, balance, and beauty. They weren't places where the congregation assembled at all. They were the houses of the cult statue. So you went in and the sacred inhabited the cult statue and the temple was meant to be seen as a statement from the outside. And all the religious action took place at the altar, which was outside in front of the temple where you actually turn with your back to the temple to perform the sacrifices on the altar. So it was a very different idea of where sanctity was located. How did you make such a place into a Christian church? You put the altar inside, and very crucially, the people moved inside. And indeed, the walls were pushed out. They now block um, the 
area between the pillars. The walls were pushed out because it was now a place for the holy people, the congregation, to meet because the whole focus of sanctity had shifted. The destruction of the Donar Oak at Geismar in Hesse by St. Boniface in 724 and the great uh, tree, the Ermine Sul near Paderborn, cut down by Charlemagne in 772 as part of his great campaign against the Saxons. These destruction of trees were turning points in the imposition of Christianity on the Northlands. As I say, the Ermine Sul was destroyed as part of a ruthless war against the Saxons. It was described by Rudolf of Fulda as a universal column, as if upholding all things, obviously carrying the symbolic freight that we've already seen from the Norse vision of the great world ash. Yet trees also play a prominent part in the Judeo-Christian narrative. Genesis in the beginning describes two trees in the Paradise Garden, while at the very end of the New Testament we encounter in the book of Revelation the tree in the midst of the city whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. Revelation chapter 22. There was the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, in the myth of the Paradise Garden, we are presented with two trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. And this can be very baffling for the contemporary mind. The fruit of the tree of life was full knowledge, true knowledge of the whole divine creation. This is what the biblical tradition regards as wisdom. As it says in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. We've already seen how the tree is symbolically connected with the search for knowledge and profound wisdom. And this is also a theme in Buddhism. Under the shadow of the Bodhi tree, an ancient fig, Gautama Buddha attained enlightenment. And I've myself sat under a living descendant of that original body tree where the tree is still venerated in Anuradhapura, the former capital of Sri Lanka. The tree of life is associated with the fruit of wisdom. So what of the tree of knowledge? This is knowledge wrenched from its source, detached from its source and its context. Knowledge which according to the first book of Enoch caused much bloodshed on the earth. The knowledge from the second tree is partial and fragmented. It is knowledge only of a God-forsaken world in which human beings have themselves assumed the role of gods in a relentless search for power. And in the process, of course, they've discovered that abstracted from the creator and source of life, their destiny is inevitably death. In the book of the Wisdom of Solomon, it says, Wisdom, the fruit of the tree of life, renews all things in every generation. She passes into holy souls and makes them friends of God and prophets. The, no the notion of wisdom is, of course, quite problematic in our own day. It's often associated with old people and with a pre-modern cast of mind. It fits awkwardly in our contemporary culture of youth and innovation, just as trees themselves often fall victim to the demand for development. But still our specialized knowledge and our know-how, which gives us so much power over the world, continually comes up against questions of ethics, value, and beauty. We struggle to relate our partial knowledge to what is needed to shape and ensure the flourishing of whole persons. And there is also frequently tension with the concept of the common good and longer term perspectives. Wisdom should serve to combine a sense of overall meaning and connectedness with discernment and guidance 
in specific situations. But the poet T.S. Eliot lamented what he saw as a failure to create the conditions in which such wisdom could ripen. Where is the wisdom that we've lost in knowledge, he asks. Where is the knowledge that we have lost in information? Max Weber, in an analysis that is still valuable, talks of the essence of modernity being disconnectedness. He says the differentiation of the cultural value spheres, and he's referring to art, morals, and science, uh, and most pre-modern cultures did not differentiate these spheres clearly, but he said that modernity differentiates art, morals, and science, lets each of them pursue its own truths in its own way, free from intrusion. And this has resulted in a spectacular growth of scientific knowledge, a flurry of new approaches to art, and a sustained look at morals in a more naturalistic light. But the distress arising from pursuing these ways of thought in isolation from the other spheres is becoming more and more evident. We're nowhere near even the beginning of a new summer, but this is the time for expeditions into neighboring spheres in an effort to find some unitive and integrative concepts which can signal a way to transcend our present discontents. And the tree, trees are good to think with, the tree which unites so many levels of experience stands as an encouragement and a symbol which can lead us uh, along this way. In particular because we need a community of insight as we face environmental and health challenges. Our generation is characterized by behavior which seems to suggest a certain lack of awareness, a lack of recognition which causes us to waste the beauty of the world. The modern project of growth without limits with no end in view beyond the process itself arises from a particular way of seeing and thinking which had its origins in Western Christian Europe. By and large, human beings create the experiences which we expect and for which on the basis of the ideas which they have formed of the world around them, they are ready. And it follows when such ideas become embedded in a culture that a whole range of possible experience fails to register at all because we are incapable of fitting it into our understanding. Now, light has been shed on the reality of this predicament, I believe, by one of the most significant books to appear in recent years, Ian McGilchrist's The Master and His Emissary. And by the way, all these book titles are available um, in the notes uh, which um, will be available, I think, from Gresham and, and uh, from the festival afterwards. Ian McGilchrist's book, The Master and His Emissary, is a survey of recent research into the operation of the two hemispheres of our brain and the implications of such research for our understanding of the development of Western culture and our particular Western take on the world, our perspective. The author combines the experience of a former clinical director of the Maudsley Hospital here in London, together with lecturing in English literature at Oxford. He traces the aggrandizement of the faculties associated with the left hemisphere, which are grasping, foregrounding, systematizing. He traces the aggrandizement of those faculties at the expense of the wider perspectives of the right. And he suggests that the modern urban environment is itself a projection and a reinforcement of a left hemisphere take on the world. The natural environment, and above all the world of trees, which is commonly by so many people experienced as restorative, as having a healing influence, is a context in which greater balance can be, for a while, achieved. But McGilchrist concludes that what has limited the power of both art and science in our time has been the absence of belief in anything 
except the most diminished version of the world and ourselves. Wisdom, the fruit of the tree of life, beckons us beyond dogmatism and delusive clarity, whether in religion or science, and involves the cultivation of the beginner's mind, which is not naivety, but which lies on the other side of mastery in any particular field of study. Silence, stillness, and expectant attention to the unexpected broadens our perspective and deepens our awareness. They take us beyond the surface self, the mental ego level, through the dark continent within with its cravings and fears to the spiritual heart located by the Hebrews in the vitals. And if more and more we act and speak and think from this center, we grow in sanity and poise and can learn to love without distortions. The spirit draws us into a breadth of heart and mind, a sense of the beyond that is restorative and creative. In his celebrated essay on the puppet theater, the German poet Kleist reflects on the possibility that we might be able to transcend the crippling effects of excessive self-consciousness through a form of heightened consciousness. Grace, it says in his essay, appears purest in that human form which either has no consciousness, some primordial innocence, or an infinite one that is in a puppet or in a god. Therefore, I said, somewhat bewildered, we would have to eat again from the tree of knowledge in order to return to the state of innocence. Quite right, he answered. And that's the last chapter in the history of the world. We've moved from an industrial to a knowledge-based economy. The next chapter, if there is to be a next chapter, is a shift to a wisdom economy in which we shall be able to judge wisely how to use the great powers that the knowledge of the 20th century has entrusted to us. Wisdom, the fruit of the tree of life, is a way of being in the world, aware of the deep structure of life, respectful of other beings, taking life not for granted, but with thanksgiving to its author. And with such awareness, it's possible to put knowledge in its proper context and apply it to beneficent ends. This transforming awareness is symbolized in the Bible by anointing. Christ, of course, is the anointed one. Christos in Greek means anointed, the one who possesses the fullness of the wisdom of God and who is in the world to open up the way to paradise regained. But... And this is where we come to another variation on the tree theme in the Judeo-Christian narrative. As St. Paul says, this strange wisdom, which involves entering into the second innocence by self-giving and the embrace of suffering and death, this is the way to life in all its fullness. The dream of the rude is a ninth century Christian poem with echoes of the sacrifice of Odin. Listen, I will tell you the best of visions, says the Scot, the poet, what came to me in the middle of the night when voice bearers dwelled in rest. It seemed to me that I saw a more wonderful tree lifted in the air wound round with light. Yet as I lay there a long while, I beheld sorrowful the tree of the Savior until I heard it utter a sound and it began to speak words, the best of wood. That was very long ago. I remember it still, said the tree, that I was cut down from the edge of the wood, ripped up by my roots, and the tree goes on to describe the drama of the crucifixion. Death, death he tasted there. Nevertheless, the Lord rose again. 
And finally, the poet seer declares, I prayed to the tree with happy spirit then, with great zeal. There where I was alone with little company, my spirit was inspired with longing for the way forward. It is now my life's hope that I might seek the tree of victory. I'm quoting from Elaine Trahan's fine modern rendering of the poem. Trees are good to think with and also for solitary contemplation. The modern project of growth without limits and with no end in view beyond the process itself arises in the perspective of the Abrahamic religions from choosing the wrong tree. We've lost the knowledge of wisdom in the pursuit of fragmented knowledge. The pursuit of fragmented knowledge divorced from any consciousness of ourselves as creatures fashions an individual knower who looks out on the world about him and experiences not an animated nature in which he is a participant but simply matter to be exploited. Choosing the wrong tree progressively degrades a human being into someone who gets used to the dull pain of seeing nature as a lifeless desert and of treating its beauty as a deceptive mask. Dominance is substituted for connectedness in this way of knowing the universe. It is a way of knowledge, however, which leads, as Descartes the philosopher frankly affirmed, to a way of being in the world in which man regards himself as maître et possesseur de la terre, master and possessor of the earth. And now, however, things are even more serious. The habit of regarding everything as material or mental object has even infected our good opinion of ourselves because beneath much of the rhetoric about human dignity lurks fear and a reductionist suspicion that we are little more than upright animals or even worse, rapacious bipeds with a selfish genetic makeup whose happiness lies in consuming the world and treating other people as commodities which exist for our pleasure. So at the beginning of the biblical narrative, the myth of the paradise garden and the two trees at the heart of the Bible, the tree ripped up by its roots and set up at the center of the world as the cross on which Jesus Christ suffers and dies as the divine wisdom calling us back to ourselves. And finally, there is the tree in the midst of the city whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. The city of London has only a few trees that have achieved literary fame, but I wonder whether you know the one which survives at the intersection of Cheapside and Wood Street. Wood Street, of course, used to be the terminus for stagecoaches, so it was a place which uh, people knew very well when they were coming in from the country. And Wordsworth refers to this tree, which is still there at the Cheapside end of Wood Street. He refers to it in his verses on poor Susan. Because Susan, listening to a thrush, has visions of the countryside. It is a note of enchantment. What ails her? She sees a mountain ascending, a vision of trees, bright volumes of vapor through Lothbury Guide, and a river flows on through the Vale of Cheapside. Well, it's not great poetry, um, but um, <laughs> anyway, it does mean that we have one literary tree of some uh, uh, distinction among us. In modern times, the myth of the tree of life and wisdom has been brilliantly reworked in James Cameron's film, Avatar. The tree of souls is at the center of the world of Navi, of the Navi on the planet Pandora. And its existence and that of the people whose well-being is entwined with the well-being of the tree is menaced by the operations of the ominously named Resources Development Agency. I will not spoil the conclusion for those who've not seen the film, but its themes echo so many of the associations we have traced 
and they are expressed, I think, marvelously in this uh, recent film. At a time when the destruction of so much forest cover has been convincingly linked with climate change, we need, I think, to reverence the trees, to plant them, to acknowledge their healing potential, not only by the virtue of the medicinal product, products which are derived, but also by their capacity to enlarge and deepen our awareness. Thanks to the Conservation Foundation, there was a major campaign to plant yew trees during millennium year. I must confess, unfortunately, my cutting died. But uh, cuttings were taken from trees which were alive during the lifetime of Jesus Christ and planted all over the country, including in the Garden of Lambeth Palace. Shakespeare called the yew double fatal because it is both poisonous in its berries and also produces the wood used for bow staves. But more recently, however, an extract of the bark has been used in treating breast and ovarian cancer, exemplifying the ancient connection between what wounds and what heals. The most recent campaign of the Conservation Foundation, founded in 1982 by David Shreve and David Bellamy, aims to protect and celebrate the Ulmus Londinium, the London Elm. And there is a film available from the Conservation Society's website showing 26 of the many uses to which elms have been put. At the same time, there's a planting program which is providing young trees to London places with elm in their names. This program won the 2013 Creative Award in the annual Relief Awards organized by the Forestry Commission. The Elm Project is, of course, the latest response to the devastating fate which befell so many elms 30 years ago. And now the news is full of ash dieback. The disease caused by the fungus uh, was first recognized in Poland in 1992, the fungus Fraxinea. It took 20 years to appear in Berkshire, and since then it's been found in a variety of locations in England. And the Forestry Commission says, as of last week, there have been some 524 confirmed findings. The news has caused widespread concern. Any threat to trees does excite deep passion. The recent attack on the Glastonbury thorn said to be descended from the staff planted by Joseph of Arimathea when he visited the site with his nephew Jesus, that attack cause outrage. When it comes to the life of trees, we can be stirred and even healed beyond any rational calculation. In Shakespeare's comedies, people often go into the greenwood to grow, to learn, and to change. Think of As You Like It. Think of The Midsummer Night's Dream. And in the process, they often find themselves by getting lost. One of the best writers of modern English, Roger Deakin, describes in his posthumous book of 2007, Wildwood, his travels across the globe to meet some of the people whose lives are entwined with trees. He went to a wood in Wiltshire, Grovely, where the ancient healing power of trees can still be experienced. The wood is on high ground between the rivers Nadder and Wiley close by the village of Great Wishford. Since time immemorial, the villagers have had the customary right to forage in the wood. But periodically, there have been attempts by the landowner to restrict these rights. And the tradition has grown up of recalling and celebrating a charter of 1603, which guaranteed these rights, but which also required the village, and I quote from the charter, to go in a dance to Salisbury Cathedral, six miles away, once a year in May, and to claim their rights in the forest by putting up a shout on the green in front of the cathedral, grovely, 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 and all grovely. Roger Deakin slept in this wood overnight and was up by four o'clock, and he describes what happened next. 
I turned round to witness a green figure, half tree, half stag, striding towards me down the track, out of the wood, fully enveloped in antlers of leafy oak boughs. This wood woe wished me a cheery, almost casual good morning and passed on. I caught him up and discovered that he was bearing two choice boughs, one for his house and another the marriage bough to be hoisted up outside the church tower and hung out to bless the season's marriages with fertility. I was in Grovely Wood this May before Oak Apple Day on which these ceremonies take place. The ground beneath the trees was covered with a carpet of bluebells, and as I walked down an avenue of beeches, I felt the strain and the fretfulness being drawn out of me. I was no longer a busy bishop with lectures to prepare, <laughs> still alas in harness at a time of life when I was far too old to be the Archbishop of Canterbury, <laughs> but admittedly still too young to be the Pope. <laughs> Instead, under the influence of the trees, I began to breathe deeply, and a great peace engulfed me. I rested beneath the tree of life and felt life living through me without any need to pummel or organize it. Thank you very much. <laughs>